Welcome. Uh, my name is Robert McGee. I work at Cytovec Software, and today I'm going to talk about the secret language of Houdini. Uh, how many people here have never touched Houdini? Okay, good. Uh, how many people have gone through some tutorials and, you know, have a basic understanding of it? And is there anyone here working in production with it? Okay, that's about the right mix. Excellent. Because even if you've been working with it, there's probably still parts of the language you don't quite understand. Because it's deep. Uh, so Houdini is a 3D animation and visual effects software that does a lot of things. It's traditionally known for doing visual effects, fluids, pyro effects, all in the big movies. Uh, it's very good at environments, populating landscapes with trees and rocks and all that kind of thing. And it works, the procedural system works really well with that. Uh, it's got new tools for look dev and lighting. Um, game artists are starting to take advantage of what Houdini has to offer to build up games. Um, characters is something with our new kin effects coming, more people will be doing. And people are definitely doing it in conjunction with crowds uh, and also with character effects, hair, fur, cloth. Houdini's used for that in production as well. Uh, motion editing. Uh, KinFX, our new solution, uh, uh, works well with that, uh, and we have rendering solutions that uh, plug in nicely. Not only our own, but also third parties. So, so far I'm speaking in a language you all understand. These are words that you get and you go, wow, Houdini can do those things, that's great. Then you go and you either watch a tutorial or you go to the office and you hang out with some Houdini artists and everything changes and what the heck is everyone talking about? Uh, the doppity dop dop sop, you know, whatever. Uh, so today I'm going to give you a little history of where this nomenclature comes from, uh, what it means, and hopefully that will allow you to participate in those conversations and listen to those tutorials and not be confused when certain terminology comes up. So the most important thing is that Houdini works with nodes. Uh, it's a node-based workflow. And that workflow, back when we first created Houdini, nodes had a different name. We tended to refer to them as operators. Now, there are different kinds of nodes or operators for different parts of Houdini. So we have the object level, we have geometry nodes, we have uh, look dev nodes for, for creating USD, tasks, task nodes. And so you just sort of put those two things together and you get the acronyms that we use. So surface operators are called SOPs, and that's where geometry is. Dynamic operators are DOPs, and that's where they live. Uh, LOPs is for look dev. So it's fairly simple, uh, but a lot of Houdini artists will revert to this. Even though in the interface we actually try to pull away from it as much as we can, uh, you still do encounter it a little bit in the interface, but definitely when Houdini artists are chit-chatting, they'll just say, oh, I threw a couple SOPs down and you know, solved my problem. Okay, so if you know what that means, it's great. If you don't, you're confused. Another thing that's important to understand about these different contexts within Houdini is that they it's like a Russian doll. They sort of, they, they, there's many layers that are possible. So at the top, we've got two main layers. You've got the object level and a new one called the stage level, which is where the, 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 the USD um, happens. So if I'm at the object level, I put down an object, and every object has inside it a SOPnet. So you already got a layering of one network type with another. Put another one down, again, you got a SOPnet inside. On the stage, you might put down a LOP that ingests USD. It maybe references it off disk. But you can also put down a LOP that has a SOPnet in it, just like you did at the object level. So again, the sort of nesting of one type uh, into another. Or you might have a LOP, a material builder LOP, so then it'll have a VOPnet inside it for building materials. So these things don't run in parallel. They are often nested within each other to create a hierarchy. And anytime you're in any particular network node, you have the ability to put down a different network node. So you have the ability to say, I want a ROP node, or I want a LOP node, or whatever. So I could be working on an object and say, I want to add a material, so I'm going to put a VOP node net inside it. And if I'm going to uh, you know, do some sort of dynamics thing, maybe I have a DOP net inside. What's interesting about the way Houdini is, is many of the tools in Houdini are actually digital assets that have this kind of nesting inside it. So you could have a, a, a tool at the SOP level that has dynamics inside it. 
and we're going to look at some of those examples a little bit later. And similarly, the stage, you could, you, you could have different kinds of networks there as well. So the, as we talk, you know, we're going to see that there's this layering that goes on, and this is important to understanding a bit about how Houdini works. Before we get into the specific nomenclature of each of those, I want to just go over some of the terms that you may or may not be familiar with within the Houdini environment. So when we're talking about look dev layout and so on, uh, we have Mantra. Mantra is our, our legacy render. So if you were working at the object level in Houdini, putting lights and objects and so on there, you would render to Mantra. We then recently came out with a new context called LOPS, which is where we do look dev, and it's all based on USD. Uni USD being the universal scene description, which is a Pixar open source initiative um, that the community is sort of grabbing a hold of. So a lot of people are moving their lighting into Solaris, uh, and it creates a different kind of flow uh, that specifically converts everything to USD. In order to render that, Mantra doesn't know USD, so we created a new render called Karma. So it is a USD-based render. It is a Hydra delicate, Hydra being the technology that sits between USD and the render. So it, it, it allows a render to connect into it. It allows us to use other renders like V-Ray, Arnold, Redshift, RenderMan. They can all plug into Solaris because of that Hydra sort of inter, inter, intermediate spot. Karma has two flavors right now. CPU um, is just a traditional render, renders the CPU. XBO's in beta right now, uh, but it is a hybrid render that will try to use the GPU, get, get as far as it can with the GPU, and only pull the CPU in when it needs to. Because of that, it's GPU-based means it's faster, much faster. And um, if you've seen some of our other presentations, you know, you'll see that very much is probably going to be the future of where people will be rendering in Houdini. Um, so... You know, that's important to understand. On the sort of animation and character front, uh, traditionally we would draw our bones at the object level and then capture them at the geometry level and then manage them that way. Uh, we have a new initiative called KinFX, which currently is focused on retargeting and motion editing. So you can bring an FBX file with a character, bring in some motion from another character, retarget it, and then you know add some other effects and spit it out. We'll talk a little bit about that later. It will be the future of rigging an animation in Houdini, and that isn't quite there in this version, but it, or in the latest version, but it will be in the future. So that's and this puts all of the rigging down at the geometry level. And there's many advantages that we'll take advantage of when that's the case. Uh, motion effects is this, it's tied to animation and it's uh, chops, channel operators. Um, and it's primarily for like layering procedural solutions on top of, of, of existing channels. So we'll, we'll, we'll look at that as well. For VFX, some of the terms you might want to know is flip is... Um, the solver for fluids. Vellum is a solution for a whole bunch of different things. It's fast. It's, it might not be as accurate as some of the other solvers, but it's fast and easy to work with. It's also an integrated environment. So we're cloth, soft bodies, fluids, grains. These can all work together and integrate together. So that's, that's a term that will come up from time to time. Pyrofex is where we do all our fire and smoke. Uh, bullet is an, a rigid body, fast rigid body dynamics. And, um, it's used quite extensively. Now, pops are particles, but we used to have a separate context for particles called pops. Eventually, it just made more sense to put that into the dynamics context. So pops, you'll find them in DOPS. Again, and we keep the pop name just so that, again, the legacy, you can, you can find them if you were used to working in pops. But So particles are now in DOPS. So let's start looking at the main context of what they are, and I'm going to do some demo or, or run some demos of, of them in action, and we can talk about, about, uh, about what that means. So we've got our object level, uh, primarily focused at, on transformations, just moving things around, orienting them, um, and usually the shape of that thing exists inside or somewhere else. Uh, some of the things that exist at the object level are objects with geometry nodes or SOPs inside. Uh, lights uh, and cameras, which are sort of moving their way more to Solaris and LOPS, but they do exist at the object level. And you can actually set them up at the object level and then pull them into, into Solaris later. So, so 
there's lots of possibilities for sharing. Similarly, um, we have bones and null objects for building hierarchies. Uh, those are going to be replaced with tools in the SOP level with kin effects. Um, and again, you could do it at the object level and ingest it in, um, or you can build it from scratch at the SOP level. So here we have, I'm just going to rig up this sort of um, soccer ball using the object level. So I'm first putting down a null object, um, and I'm going to parent uh, parenting relationships work at the object level. Uh, so I can take that soccer ball control and put it above the soccer ball, parent that in. I can turn off the display, the selection of the soccer ball, so in the viewport I really can only get access to the null object. I'm then going to take the translate x, and I'm going to bring that down, and I'm going to put a transform node down at the geometry level. So there are transformations down at the geometry level, but um, they're functioning in a slightly different way. And I'm going to put an expression here that essentially creates a rolling ball when I move translate x um, using a standard expression. So once I get up, I select that, and I go and I move along x, and I've got a rolling ball that's accurate to the size and dimension of the object. I'm now going to put a second control down. And so you notice that in that case, I built a relationship between what was happening at the object level and what was happening down at the geometry level. I'm going to do that again with this. This is going to be called what I'm going to call the squash control. And I'm going to parent that so that it works uh, with the null object, so it always moves with the, the ball. Uh, but I'm going to take it and, again, get an expression from translate y, go down. I'm going to put down a bend node. So the bend node will allow me to, I can just configure that here using this option, where I say go from here to here, and then I'm going to turn on an option where I'm going to use that expression that I brought from above. I'm just going to add one. Uh, change a couple options there, and now when I go to that top level and I grab that control, I'm getting my squash and stretch. So I build a relationship between the object level and down below. My animation is all going to happen at the object level, but my shape is going to be, be sort of set up at the geometry level. Then I can lock some of these parameters. The advantage of that is you see the handles that I have. Um, they, it pairs it down to only those handles that are unlocked, so it makes it really easy to know what to do when you grab an object. You don't have to worry about parameters that aren't really playing a role. Yeah, and that's basically the essence of, of that sort of uh, little workflow. So let's go to the geometry level, uh, SOPs. And in this case, um, we're going to take this um, simple sort of mug and we'll build it from scratch. And here you're going to see the relationship between me working in the viewport and the geometry nodes that get created. So I'm putting down a tube. I got it off the shelf. Um, I'm going to set some of its parameters. That top bar, the operation controls, is actually letting me control the parameters that are inside the object, so I don't have to dive down to get it. Uh, but then I can go, move it up, and then when I want to, and I say, okay, now I want to go down, I can change my selection to edge selection, and it will take me uh, down to that level. So after I rotate, I go to edge selection, double click on that, and you'll see in the network it says geometry. So I've, div I've gone one level down. So then I go tab um, polyfill, and I set that up the way that I need. And once I've got that in place, then I can poly extrude this to give it some thickness. So I'm going to, oh no, before I do that, I'm going to give it its proper shape. So I take a bunch of points, and that adds an edit node, an edit SOP, and then I can use my um, uh, fall off there to get a nice, nice shape there. Now I can select all of the faces, and then this time I'm going to poly extrude. I'm going to push it in, and then you've got an option for adding a back. Now because it's dark, it's telling me that I'm looking at the wrong side of the polygon, so I can reverse that to, to see the right side of the polygons. Um, now once I have that, um, what I want to do is add the handle to the cup. So you'll notice that everything I do in, in Houdini, I can work in the viewport, and the result is a node in the network, uh, that I can work with. And I can go back and make changes to anything along the way, uh, but if I just, modeling generally is a straight, of, straight ahead action, I can just keep moving forward by doing things in the viewport and, and getting the results. Um, so I'm putting the handle, it's not pointing in the right direction, uh, but I can go in and get this handle here. Now I can't see the handle yet, I, what I need to do is just make sure I've got the 
the handle tool selected and the node selected, and then I'll get a handle that's specific to that. So every, well, most uh, SOPs have handles that work in the viewport, and you just have to use that handle tool with that tool selected. Um, so now I can take all of that and um, I can use this. There's some controls that just work in the parameter pane, like this uh, ramp here for doing the handle. And then once I've got that, I'll select everything again. So I'm going to subdivide, press N, enter, and I'll just add one more layer of depth. But what fun is a cup if you don't smash it? So we're going to take that and, and smash it into a bunch of pieces using our shatter tool. And we can add as many chunks as we want. And now you notice me putting a tool here in the in the network view. So you can also put a tool in there. The only thing is after you put it down, you've got to set the display flag. Otherwise, you won't see it in the viewport. Uh, but you can work in the network view if you want. The transform tool we did in the 3D view, and so it put it down with the, with the flag already set. So that saves you an extra click. But you can even do things like, like if I spread this off, want to add some color, for instance, I can go tab color and just plop it in between those two. And so, you know, you don't always have to be in the 3D view to get a node to do what you want. You can work in the network view as well. So now I've got that. Now I'm going to work, use network view again. I'm going to go tab RBD bullet solver. And again, I got to set the display flag to make that real. Um, and I'm going to go in and add a collision geometry and set a few parameters. Um, and once I get that to where I want it, I press play and I've got my rigid body dynamics. Now, of course, some of you are going, wait a second, we're at the geometry level, why am I doing dynamics here? You just broke your own rules. That's why I talked to you earlier about the nesting. This RBD bullet solver is a node that has DOPS inside it. So we have taken many of our tools at the, at the dynamics level and said, you know what, let's make simple versions of them. If all you've got to do is smash a cup, why go all the way into DOPS and work with nodes you don't have to wor work with? We've got one node that just solves the problem. Um, so we started with dynamics in there. We've also added uh, a lot of the vellum nodes work at this level. Uh, flip fluids just got added to this level. The Pyrofx tools we're going to see later can work at this level. And part of the motivation for that was that SOPS was being used to configure things for dynamics anyways. So often you'd put attributes and things to make it work better for dynamics. So it's like, well, SOPS ended up to be the logical place for that. So SOPS is geometry, but it can do so much more because it's, you know, it's going to have rigging soon. It's got some dynamic stuff. So it's, it's, it's a real workhorse within the Houdini environment. Uh, here's some Kinefx uh, example uh, that we had recently. So in this case here, the yellow version of the character was animated in a very quick and sort of static way. And then nodes were added for the blue is ragdoll dynamics. Uh, the red has what we call secondary motion nodes added. Uh, and then the green was him going back and re-keyframing things he didn't like in the red one. So you can do a whole bunch of this. And here we can see the, the SOP network. So you've got, this is the initial animation brought in. Um, this is the ragdoll version of it, and that goes to the blue. Uh, secondary motion and swinging, which then becomes the red. And then he tweaks the results with keyframe. So it's this flow and ability to layer and be procedural about motion that's getting us excited about moving character stuff into the geometry level. So now let's look at the dynamic level. Even though a lot of it is buried inside SOPs, uh, the dynamic level itself um, has other benefits, specifically when you're integrating things together. So the first example I've got is this wine glass. So we've got fluids and RBDs uh, all working within the same system. So it makes sense for us to consider this as a DOPS example um, rather than, than SOPs. Um, so here we have a wine glass, not unlike our our cup, and we have configured it for dynamics. So there's an auto dop network, which we'll dive into in a second. And it basically ingests the cup, adds in a ground plane, and now this is where I can set my, my parameters on. And the solver is here, so if I need to tweak the solver. But if you go to the geometry level of the wine cup, you'll see the whole bunch of nodes are put in there specifically to configure and get it ready for going into DOPS. So it's always a bit of a two-way conversation anyway with that. We're now going to take the bullet and add that into the mix. And there it is. 
uh, we, we, we didn't animate the bullet, we're actually going to let it be dynamic. So it's going really fast, um, set the density of lead, um, and we're going to go back to the cup and we're going to say, well, there's different parts. When we shattered it, we had different parts. We want that one part, number 84, to be passive. So we're going to make everything else active, but 84 is passive. So when the, it won't move when the, when the bullet strikes. Just a creative decision there, but it's, it's, it's important. Um, so now we go and we press play and it doesn't look like the bullet, it's falling, but it doesn't look like the bullet's hitting it. And one of the reasons there is the bullet's going so fast that at one frame it's in front of the, the cup and at one frame it's behind the cup and it never really hits it. So we're going to add in sub-steps so that, so that we actually calculate some of the stuff in the intermediate frames and now we're getting a better result with it uh, actually hitting the cup. Now we're going to take another piece of geometry and convert it into a fluid using the shelf tools. One thing that's nice about the, the shelf tools is they tend to just put things in the right place. Um, so some people are like, well, I want to do it with the nodes. Well, use the shelf tools to learn how to make the node networks, and then you'll understand how they work a little bit better. Uh, and sometime, and they save you steps, so why would you do more clicks if you don't have to? Um, so once we get that running, we can run, um, sped that up a little bit, um, but there's the simulation. And we're only going to go to about the 10th frame, because in the animation, we go up to about to a certain amount and then suck it back in. There we have it surfaced and there we go. So it's coming out and then, re so we used a retime node to slow it down and then go backwards in time and that's, that's part of that example. The next thing is um, this bomb. Um, so there's some particles, we have a new spark tool, um, RBD dynamics as well as Pyrofex. So this is another example that um, we can look at. Now we're going to focus specifically here on the pyre effect. So we put down what's called the simple um, fireball and it puts down a nice little network of nodes at the geometry level. So this is again one of those examples where it's a SOP workflow but it's got DOPS embedded in it. Uh, and so we start with this nice um, burst source node which gives us a nice little explode, like it sets all the attributes and velocities and so on we need to kick off um, it. We have to set it up for the right time, so because we don't want the explosion at time zero, we want it at time 200, so there's attributes for that. And there we go, and that's the out-of-box experience. Now, this is a, what's using what's called the minimal solve, which means it's using the GPU, and we're getting fast feedback in the viewport. Now, I may want to go back and, and just change some of the size and scope of this because of the scale of the bomb that we're working with, so we can change some of those parameters and get us um, exactly what we need. Once we've got that, we can press play and now we've got um, a more detailed sim uh, that's specifically the size we need. Now, the one thing about this is you see little chunks flying all over the place from the RBD. And one of the things that would be nice is to bring that and plug that in and have that influence the, the, the pyro sim. Now it's not doing that right now, we just need to add um, some other nodes. So we brought in things, we need to unpack it, we need to convert it into a, a VDB, and then it will be in the language um, that the Pyrofex solution wants. And we can play with the volume, um, and we can put in a, a peak node if we want to beef those up a little bit just to make sure that they have a little more effect. And what's nice about all this is we're just taking the sim that we did before of the rigid body objects, bring it in, and letting it do its job. So once we get that up and running, um, we can press play, and you'll see now the pyro effects is actually being influenced by the RBD objects with a little bit of an error because we weren't pointing at the right frames. So my simulation looks completely different now because I'm getting these nice little tendrils and little puffs of smoke coming off from that. So this is the kind of, um, and this is all managed at the SOP geometry level, so that's pretty cool. But underneath, at the core, there is a DOP, bunch of DOP nodes you just don't have to look at, but it is helping with the process. Um, okay, so now let's make a switch into a different part of the pipeline, um, which is look dev, uh, layout, and lighting. This is the LOP context, and it is also known as Solaris. So if you've heard us ever talk about Solaris, Solaris is sort of, it's like a brand within a brand. It's not a separate product, it's in Houdini, it's just basically the LOP context. But because it's this whole workflow that wraps up, you know, USD and all these different things, we gave it a big banner, pretty name. 
And like I said, it focuses on USD, which we talked about earlier, the, 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 the Pixar uh, universal scene description. So everything you do in Solaris is getting converted into this scene graph, um, and, and that's um, quite a useful thing. And there's two ways of thinking about that. One is if you're an artist who doesn't care about USD, then just pretend it isn't there. Just work with the nodes. Uh, if you do care about USD, then you're going to put down nodes specifically to configure your USD to work with your pipeline. So Houdini can handle both philosophies. It just depends on how, how meticulous you are about your use of USD. So here we have an example where we had a soccer ball at the object level, um, and we've imported it in. Uh, so it, it, you have a lot for importing it in, converts it to USD. We're now making a backdrop. Now this one, instead of building at the object level, we put down a version of a LOP that has a SOPnet in it. So we can actually model uh, the backdrop right here in LOPs. And again, that will get converted um, as we go. Now one of the things that's a little bit different about, about this is everything you do gets put in the, the little um, widget in the bottom corner, which is the scene graph. And the scene graph is essentially the USD description of what's going on. So as you add things and subtract things, lights and whatever, you'll see in the scene graph in the corner start to build up and, and become something that you, a usable thing within the context of this. So here we went up. Now at the object level, you can have a bunch of objects sitting there displayed at the same time. In LOPs, there has to be a flow. So we fed the backdrop into the soccer ball or we could merge them together and now we're feeding them into the camera. So the camera tool functions more or less the same as it did at the object level. We can put an environment light in, and now we can kick in the Karma render. Um, and this, we can turn on the denoiser in the side to sort of have it resolve a little faster and turn off the handle. So we put that, this basic dome light in, that's good. Now we're gonna put another point light in, but instead of trying to position the light from behind, we've got these great tools in Solaris where you can say, well, I want the light to hit here, and I'm going to shift select the shadow to go there. And then I'm going to control click to get a, I can get dense, distance away and intensity just with the mouse click. So I don't have to leave my camera frame to make lighting decisions. They're actually happening uh, in there. So if I put another light down, let's add one here in the network, and set the display flag. This time I say that's where I want my diffuse highlight, uh, pull that back, really beef up the intensity maybe go to 400, and that's sort of the key light. Again, I did it right there in the view. I didn't have to go off and do it somewhere else. Now I can add in what's called the light mixer. This is where I can take my existing lights and start to tweak them and explore them. Like for instance, I can solo the different lights and see what the contribution of that light is. I can then say, well, let's play with the contribution of this light and then go back, did I, do I like the result there? No, maybe it was too much move that down. I can add colors, do other things as well. I can actually even totally reposition lights here because everything's procedural in Houdini. Let's say a senior lighter set up the three lights. I don't want to change what they did, but I need to edit it for my purposes. I can use the light mixer to do an alternative version of the lighting and then get it reviewed and so on. Now I'm putting down um, a material library where I'm starting to put down materials. In this case, we're going to use VEX materials, which are the Houdini ones. They were the ones that we were using for Mantra, and they also work with Karma CPU. If you want to use Karma XPU, um, this can sort of convert into that, but you're really better off if you do Material X, and we'll talk about that in, a, in another section. So here I am sort of beginning to assign material. Um, so every primitive, and then there's every material. And notice that when we added the materials, they popped up in the scene graph. So again, the scene graph gets populated by all the lights, cameras, materials um, that you do. And again, if you're an artist who doesn't care, just don't look at that thing in the corner. Um, just set up the nodes and wire things together and you'll get a, a friendly result. We actually even have a way where if you're at the object level and you've set up a scene to put a Karma node down at the ROP level, it will take your whole scene in and render it because it's got a lop net inside it. So again, that multi-layer thing. So you could totally ignore Solaris altogether and just do it at the object level. But there's lots of advantages, especially these lighting tools and so on to do it here. So you can even take an object that you got and rotate it. You can, you know, procedurally in a non-destructive way, move it around because you, you need it a different way for your shot. Um, now we're going to add color to the backdrop, but it didn't have the, the UVs were not set up 
yet. Um, so we go back into the backdrop and we can insert a UV node and we're gonna do this before we bend and then that way the UVs will bend properly instead of, and there we go, we've got that light back. And then once you've got to the end, you can add a couple nodes for the rendering process, so render settings. So these can be higher quality render settings designed um, for final output, and then a node to render that. And then we go in and we come out and, and, and there we go. So Solaris, you know, it's a great place to learn about USD, to work and configure with USD. It's also got some really nice lighting tools and camera tools as, as the future of, of the look dev uh, lighting um, process in Houdini. So another area of Houdini, uh, COPS uh, for composite nodes. Um, this part is probably, I mean, uh, you're not gonna use it in place of Nuke, uh, but you might use it as a lighter to do some slap comps, to test your AOVs. So before I send my AOVs off to the next, next part of the process, I'm gonna make sure they actually work. So here's just an example of a bunch of the soccer balls. So I rendered it out with some AOVs. Um, so I've got like diffuse, indirect diffuse, and so on and so forth. And then I can actually break those out with channel copy and I can say, well, okay, show me them. And I just press the shift key to um, show different versions of these nodes. And once I have that, um, I can make comparisons between them if I want. Um, I can also, you know, I have um, a version in here for uh, without shadows. So one of the things you can do is get a pass without shadows, then take all your diffuse passes and then blend them together and say, I want to tone down the shadows. So I, do I want lots of shadows? Do I want less shadows? So that's sort of the way you would do that. I mean, you do that in compos other compositors, but, but again, this is where you make sure you got the right passes and that you're passing it on appropriately. And then we've got standard ones like um, brightness and contrast. So we can set that up if we want. And you know, compare it back to the original image and say, did we make it better or did we not make it better? There's also an option for doing a diff between them with a slider that goes between them, but I, I just put them side by side here. So the VOP context, VEX operator. So VEX is a expression language that we use for a number of different purposes in Udini. It's traditionally been used to make materials for Mantra and also for Karma. Uh, but it's got a bit of a bottleneck that made it not ideal for using with uh, Karma XBU. So we started incorporating Material X in the last release or two. And the specific idea there is to create a much more streamlined, better solution for Material X so that it is, um, there's no roadblocks, it's, it's perfect. But you, know, you can still render with VEX, if you, if you have to do something really complicated that only VEX can do, you can still do that and go to Karma CPU. But if you wanna go to XPU, you're better off to go Material X. The other thing about VEX and VOPs is it's not just about materials. You can actually create a VOP net that pushes and pulls points on a surface or uh, creates a custom cop node or something like that. So there are other uses for VOPs, um, but for this I'll focus mostly on the material material part. Um, so here's an example of a scene that was rendered out in, in Houdini um, with Karma, and he was using both Karma XBU, so he, he wanted to explore both, both um, the principled shader, which is a, a wrapped up sort of uber shader that comes with VEX, and you can just assign materials directly to that. Um, you can also extend it to add other things, but for this example, we're just going to assign those, those, the materials right to the Uber shader. Then we go back up to the um, Solaris level where we can assign those materials, and there we go. And, you know, in addition to, to, to just basic texture mapping, you can also do displacement um, through the Uber shader as well and set those parameters accordingly. So bumps and normals are, are calculated or full displacement maps. Um, and then a little beefy there, might want to tone it down. And there we go. 
So now if we want to go more in the XPU and we want to use Material X, now it's important Material X also does render with Karma CPU. So if you decide to do everything with Material X, you're going to be good to go no matter what. Um, in this case, you've got right now, you've got to sort of build your material up yourself a little bit. So he's got a standard Material X standard material, uh, and then he's going to add, um, we're going to add a bunch of uh, materials here. And the, the, the textures are actually added with their own nodes. So there's a Material X texture image node. So you make that, add the channel, and wire it in. And this shows a little more of the bot workflow where you're actually putting nodes down, wiring them in. Um, you also have a little gear icon up in the, in, the, in the parameter pane, and you can actually use the gear icon to create something as well. One of the options there is to um, promote a parameter um, if you need to get a parameter promoted up to a higher level. So a number of things you can do there. So, uh, so Bob's, the first place you're probably going to encounter it is in uh, the creation of materials. Uh, and this, this chess, uh, it's actually interesting because they like this chess set so much that the Material X um, open source initiative has a version of this chess set available with all the Material X materials for you to tinker with um, on, on their site. And I think they presented it somewhere, somewhere at SIGGRAPH. Um, so they ignored the Houdini part, but they got, they got the results. So, and it's also got displacement and all sorts of things there. And in terms of Material X, one of the things we've been doing with 19.5 is we've included some Material X nodes that Material X doesn't have. Like we found certain gaps that we know our customer needs filled, so we're going to put our version of those nodes to fill the gaps, and then we'll share them with the Material X Foundation, and maybe they'll become official someday. But for now, uh, we, we don't want to make sure that the gaps are filled and people are in good shape. So now this is a different acronym, HDA. Uh, it stands for what's called Houdini Digital Asset. And it's a very interesting and important part of working with Houdini. Uh, and it, it affects the workflow. Um, and it essentially allows you as an individual to build your own tools, uh, but without having to program. So we'll go through that process. Now, one of the things, uh, I'm going to dig up an old name. Back at the beginning, when we first created uh, HDAs, we called them OTLs for some reason, um, Operator Type Library. Uh, so we had the OTL name, and we had the HDA name, and people would get confused, so we merged them together, and now they're called HDAs. But every once in a while, you were sitting somewhere, and somebody will mention OTLs. They're, they're just talking about an HDA. And actually, we support both extensions, too. So a .otl file is the equivalent of a .hda file. So the basic idea of a digital asset is I got a network of nodes, and I want to collapse them into a single node. So this node has all the other nodes inside it. Then I want to create a high-level interface. So my whole network of nodes, I think an artist only needs to control 15 or 20 of those parameters. So I promote those parameters give them artist-friendly names, and then when they go back, oh, oh, sorry, in addition, I can also do things like embed geometry, textures, uh, handles, so a whole bunch of things can be wrapped up in these digital assets, and they get stored on disk. Then I take that thing from disk and I load it into another Houdini file. That artist in that file doesn't have to see all the spaghetti network that I have, they just have to see one node. So it's just a tool, it's a custom tool. And they can take that high-level interface and manipulate it to do what they want. So if I had a tool for doing a building, I might have a slider for the number of floors, I might have the, the, the length and the width, all those things would be available, and, but then all the fa fancy brickwork might be figured out procedurally and I don't have to do that, that just happens naturally. So it's, it, assets are designed around that idea, how can I put the fewest controls in artists' hands but give them the most flexibility? And, and assets can have inputs too. So for instance, you could have a, a, a digital asset that's designed to make turn a building into a ruin. So it's like I take my building and I plug it into the asset, the asset goes and makes it into a ruin. So there's that kind of thing. It can act that way as well. So here we have um, what's called the Brickify tool that, that I built a, a network for in Houdini. So it takes a piece of geometry, creates a bunch of points in there, and then assigns 
uh, little little bricks to each of the points. Uh, then we have it also has the ability to use a texture map to texture the points, um, or you can just have a straight on col uh, color. So what I've done is I've wrapped up into a digital asset here, makes us a, a sub network node here, and then we can now take nodes from inside and promote those parameters. So what's neat is I'm building a tool, but I'm not doing any programming, which means artists can be building tools or technical artists can be building tools without getting into programming. Now you can put Python script in here and you can do some programming if you want, but it's not necessary. And every parameter I put on, I can give it a name. So it makes more sense to call this shape. I can create a menu since there's only two shapes that I want, it's either um, the rubber toy or it's a custom shape. So I get a menu out of that. If I press OK, you see there it is and I can switch back and forth between them. Um, and now I can promote as many parameters as I want from there. So I can also bring up, um, this is choosing whether I use a color or a texture map. So again, it's just clicking into these things and promoting that. And then the color has a color that I might want to change so I can also go in and get that node and promote that. Or I can go to the texture map node and promote that. Uh, so these things can always be edited later. You're giving your artist as much control as you want, but you get to decide, control how much control you give them. <laughs> um, so once you get that, um, you can set the defaults that you want. We also have a nice feature where you can sort of disable a parameter or at least uh, disable it when under certain conditions. So we're doing it such that here, depending on what your look is, if it's a texture map, you see you can't see the color, and if it's a color, you can't see the texture map. Or you can see it, but you, it's blocked out. So once I have that, I'm going to save that digital asset and then unlock it. And when I go in, you'll see it's all grayed out. Ideally, when I hand this to someone else, they don't mess with what's going on inside. Uh, and there are ways of just collapsing it so they can't, compiling it so they can't even see it at all. So that's the essence of, of what a digital asset is. Now, I have a digital asset and I go, wow, wouldn't it be fun if I could use that somewhere else, like in a, another application? But it's not like FBX or, or some other format where it's, it's generic. This thing needs Houdini. So what we created was something called Houdini Engine. And Houdini Engine is a plugin that you can put into Unreal, Maya, or Unity. And so when you bring a digital asset in, it will cook the nodes in the network uh, using the Houdini. So you install Houdini on your machine, it will use that and go. You don't, there could be some people on your team who have Houdini installed, but they never look at it. They only look at it through Unreal, Maya, or Unity. Once you've got that, then that high level interface we built, that can be actually utilized in the host application. Now this is a little abstract, so it's probably best we actually see it in action. So here I am in Maya. I've got a Houdini engine menu, and I'm going to import in the Brickify uh, asset. So the same one that I set up in Houdini is here. Now you notice the colors missing. Uh, one of the things is not all host applications support all aspects of what would work in Houdini, so we did lose the color in that case. But we did some animated bricks, and um, that actually did come over. So we can actually animate our bricks here in Maya based on the asset. And every time that animation is going on, it's basically uh, cooking down at the level of, of Houdini's doing the work and, and giving the, the results back to Maya. We can also do a custom shape. So here we're using the, the torus to do a brickified sort of donut. Um, so the geometry lives in, in Maya, but we were able to plug our Houdini asset tool into it to get the results. Now here we are in Unreal where we have the, exactly the same asset being brought in. And generally speaking, assets probably need to be tailored to the particular tool that you're going to, but this one's a pretty simple one, so it does work. Although again, the colors didn't come across. So I just put the rubber toy off in the corner, but I can also drag another one in, and just like we did uh, with the donut, I can say, you know what, I want to create this platform with a, with a brickified uh, platform. So what I do is I say, go to the custom shape, select from the outliner, and I'm gonna select all of that and use that selection. Now it's a little offset from where it needs to go, so we can just push it back. And then we can take the original geometry and just say, you know, go hide that. We don't need to see that. Uh, we don't want to see it in the game and we don't want to see it here in the viewport. Now if I go and press play to go walk around this game, 
uh, you'll see that we can now interact with uh, the platform that we created. So a brick version of that has been created in place of the other one. So, you know, some great opportunities for working in a game engine. Um, and, and again, what's important about this is if, if I'm giving as tools that I built in Houdini to my level artists here in Unreal, they don't have to know that Houdini is even involved. I mean, I guess Houdini engine, at some level they know it's involved, but the reality is it just feels like another tool in Unreal. And that means makes them a lot more comfortable. Because sometimes it's hard to get people up and running in Houdini. So, so you've got, if you've got a core people of, of more technical artists who can build tools for other places like this, then you don't have to train people on using Houdini just to get them to do something that you could have them do in a host application. So the next thing we're going to do is talk about something called top, tops, which are task operators. Uh, it has another name we call PDG, uh, which is the procedural dependency graph. Now the key to this is, is about automation and distribution. Often you'll, if you're working in Houdini, you've got a big complicated network and you're on your computer and you just make one little change and it has to change everything in your network and it's just going to take 15, 20 minutes to process. If you can take that same thing and break it down into a top net, it can manage that one little change a lot better. Um, anyway, well, let's take a look at what this means. So in a top net, you have a node which you tell it to do something. Uh, make me a parameter or, or you know, open a file or you can, it can be whatever. So you tell it to do it and it says, okay, you want me to do this 80 times. Based on the information you gave me, you, you've assigned me 80 tasks to do whatever it is. So the way those tasks get distributed is you create something called a scheduler, in this case a local scheduler, and by default it says I'm going to take a quarter of your cores on your machine and I'm going to assign those tasks. So right now you see the PDG, what's happening is seven tasks are complete, three are on the go, and 70 are in the queue. Now, if that's not going fast enough, I could tell my local scheduler, don't just use three of them, use 11 of them. So now the tasks are being done a little bit faster and I'm getting my results faster. But why stop there? We can change the scheduler to a deadline scheduler or some other scheduler, and now we can go to the compute farm or we can go to the cloud and say, go do it on there. So now I got 54 cores on the go at the same time. They're off doing their thing and spitting me back the result. So that's sort of the essence of what, of what TOPS is. And here we have an example, again using the Brickify um, node. So we have a scheduler here. And what we have is we have a directory. And the directory currently has only four assets in it. Uh, but it could have 400. It could be 4,000. Um, the beauty of this whole system is it scales up. So we'll start with four. Once we get it up and running, we could then have, do more. So we're going to just get one of those, and we're going to replace that with a star. And when we do this, uh, we can now say this file pattern thing, go get me those four pieces of geometry. So I cook that, you get four little dots. There's four files in the directory, and it went and found them and brought them in. So it, mission accomplished. So you can click on each of the dots, and you'll see the geometry in the 3D view. So now we want to put down a, what's called an HDA processor node. So this is basically a node that will allow you to assign a digital asset to it. So I'm going to assign the Brickify uh, asset to it. And then it will go and process that uh, for each, each of the incoming pieces of geometry will get Brickified. We have to set a couple little settings here. Uh, but once you're finished, um, you would just um, cook that. So you right click and you say cook clean up and cook. It thinks about it for a bit, and there you go. I've now got four objects, and they're all bricks now. They've been brickified. But they're using the default texture. We don't want that default texture. We want to actually use um, our own. So I have a directory where in that directory are all the textures with their names corresponding to the names uh, in the geometry. So we just changed that to uh, texture underscore file star. And if we process that, we'll see that we get four of those that um, correspond. Now, we need to get them collected together. 
so that the, they sort of work in parallel and then we can start to uh, assign it back to the, the digital asset. So we sort by, by the node, we plug in the two types of nodes, and when we cook that, what you're gonna see is that from a, they've created a version um, for geometry and a version for texture. So you cook it, and we're, we're, in the viewport, we're only seeing the geometry, but if you middle click on there, you'll see that it's got both the geometry and the texture map listed. So the texture map is coming along for the ride, uh, and we just have to figure out how to use it. So we go back to um, the HDA processor. Well, first, if we do it, it's, it's not going to work. The HDA processor is, it doesn't know what to do because we didn't, we didn't know, we haven't yet to assign the texture map. So what we can do is we can just go to the texture map field here and replace it with at PDG index dot one. So dot zero is the geometry and dot one is the texture map. So if we say go use that, now when we go to recook that node, it's gonna go through and we're gonna get the proper texture map touching each of these elements. So there we go. So there we go. Now, what we want to do is, let's say we're going to process a whole bunch of these assets and we want to review the results. So what we can do is set up a simple scene and render that scene. So we can go through and just, we'll turn that off and we'll go down to here and set up our lights and our cameras and we'll say, let's render that scene. So we can put down a mantra node uh, and, or a karma node. Um, I haven't updated this video for a while, so it's... Uh, would be a karma node now, and then export our, our files as um, at PDG, at, yeah, at PDG.index. So it'll number the files accordingly depending on the index file of the, of the thing. And we'll, and we'll just do them as JPEGs. So if we go and we cook that node, now we're cooking each node one at a time because we're in the process of designing this flow. But once this flow is done and ready, then we can just point it in a network, say go process that and we don't have to think about it or worry about it. But here we are, there's our little rendering for that. And then if we wanted to review them all, uh, we just collect them all and then go in and say, let's do an image magic um, node and that will actually turn it into a mosaic. And then we can review them all at once. So lots of interesting nodes within this context. One thing that's interesting about PDG or TOPS is there are things you can do in here that have nothing to do with Houdini. You can be running Python scripts, you can be moving files around, you can be doing a whole bunch. So it's a pipeline tool that goes above and beyond Houdini work, uh, although it is specifically good for Houdini work. And there we go, we get our mosaic with the four. And that could easily be turned into a bunch more objects or a bunch more or a bunch more. And that would make sense if you're using the cloud or you're using the farm to just pump this stuff out. So PDG, it's a great tool. It lives within Houdini. It's not a separate product. It is within Houdini. It's one of the contexts and you can go do some interesting things with it. So chops, we mentioned channel operators and motion effects a little bit earlier. Um, so let's just take a quick look at that. So here's a bouncing soccer ball that was animated using traditional sort of techniques. The rig that we built way at the beginning, uh, it was used to animate this. Now what we want is we want it to feel like when it's on the ground that it's sort of hitting some rocks and sort of bumping up and down. Instead of keyframing that, we're going to use motion effects to put a procedural solution down. Probably a little exaggerated there. Let's reduce it down to one. And that's getting us a little more of what we want. Uh, we can then go and add another node down, a limit node, which says don't go below zero and don't go above six. So in this case, uh, it just sits on the ground. So it doesn't, but you're still getting a few bumps going up. We can also say, well, we don't need any noise um, in the early part of the animation. We only need it for the flat part at the end. So we can keyframe the amplitude there, keyframe the amplitude at the beginning, and then just create, um, we go in and create a hard switch. Um, then it will, no, no noise and then noise. So anyway, motion effects is fun. It's a right menu off of things that you, channel that you have operated, uh, that you have animated, uh, and you can just sort of work from there. Okay, ROPs. These are outputs or re render 
outputs. Um, and they have their own context, which traditionally made sense when you were doing Mantra. So you would set up your scene at the object level, and then you'd have a render operator for Mantra or HQ. Uh, they have wedge ones if you want to try different parameters. Uh, if you're doing simulations, maybe you render out a geometry sequence. Uh, but as time goes by, these things have been moved other places. Um, you know, like a geometry cache will happen right at the SOP level. Um, or um, karma is happening in LOPs. Mantra isn't happening as much. So here's an example. If I'm at the SOP level, you'll see a bunch of things called ROPs for FBX export and so on. Now, in these cases, are these actually ROPs? Maybe not. Uh, it's just become the general term for output. So uh, I think Houdini users are used to looking for ROP, so we kept that terminology even if you're in LOPs or SOPs. Just type ROP, you'll get all of the tools, and then you can sort of pick the one you need and go. Well, I hope I've been able to give you a good introduction to the terminology around Houdini, the different contexts that exist. If you'd like to go and learn how to use Houdini, uh, we have a number of tools online to support that. Uh, the first is things called learning paths. So if you go to the learn menu, there's a thing called learning paths. And these are curated lists of tools, of tutorials, focused on a particular part of the product. So getting started, if you're just getting in for the first time, go there. If you're into game development with Unreal, we have a section for that. Um, and they're a great place to go and find the latest and greatest tutorials. Uh, we also have the, just the huge monster list of tutorials itself, but you can filter that by viewer version number, by topic. Here I filtered it by a particular artist named Rock Andrik, who's good into character stuff. And a new feature that we added was I was able to take one of his tutorials and bookmark it. And there's a new section called My Learning. So if you're logged into the website, you can bookmark tutorials and they will show up in a custom sort of learning path page. And as you start doing the tutorials, it will keep track of your progress and move them up into the in progress section. When you complete them, it'll go to the completed section. And so the advantage is, instead of you always being faced with a huge list of tutorials, I don't remember the one, I, I had this one I was interested in, but I forgot to do it. Just bookmark it, it'll go into your list and you'll be good to go. So we really wanna help people manage that process within the, the side effects website. Now, many of the examples I showed today, uh, if you were looking for every click or how to do every click, that wasn't what this was about. Uh, but there are those same tutorials available on the website with every click and videos and so on. So every one of these comes with videos as well as a PDF document that you can print out and follow along with. Um, you know, because some people like one way, some people like other, sometimes it helps to even have both. Um, and then our goal is somewhere in the fall is to take all of the PDFs and compile them into a printable book. So we did that about a few years ago, but we haven't updated, I mean, updates, there's constant updates. Um, so the, I, we're gonna have a 19.5 version coming soon. Um, and that will be print on demand. So you can go to a website and it'll just print out a copy for you and send it. So we're, we're getting there. We still got a few uh, lessons to update to 19.5, but we're, 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 we're on the right path. Well, thank you very much. I hope you this was helpful, um, that, that you know a little more about the language of Houdini today than you did before you got in here, and that it will inspire you to go off and uh, dig a little deeper in your own learning. So thanks again.